starting the Waitley Elementary School Committee meeting at 401. Uh, calling the meeting to order at 401. Um, so can I get um, a move to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Beth? Second. Okay. All in favor, Bob? Yes. Beth? Yes. And Maureen, yes. Um, I just want to welcome Beth to to the Waitley School Committee. Um, very uh, excited to have you here. Thanks, Maureen. And, uh, hope, hope it's a, a good year. Um, so, Shelly, the financial statement. So uh, we signed, or you signed, and reviewed 11 warrants since last meeting, totaling $35,110.67. Um, Beth, have you started getting those warrant emails yet from Michelle? It comes, um, it would go to your Frontier email, but it won't forward. If you have a forwarding feature, it won't forward to your personal email. Um, who are they coming from? It would come from through Adobe Sign from Michelle Melnick. I'm not sure we've received any since Beth came on board. No, Maybe not. I don't have anything from her. Okay, so keep an eye out for that. We sign warrants electronically. And again, it doesn't forward from your frontier to your personal address. So it was it, about every two weeks or so you guys are seeing them, Maureen, Bob? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think so, so yeah. We run two warrants a month. I actually think she has to bring one to the town tomorrow. Um, so you should see one again in a couple of weeks. So just keep an eye out for that. And she did ask me for your email address. So I know she's added you. So if you're not getting those messages, just let me know. Okay, thanks. Um, and then the process there is, you know, just review them. If you have questions, they get brought up. Either you can email me or call me or we can talk about it here. Great, thank you. Uh, so I did email everyone the expense reports. There was a school choice and a general fund expense report through September 30th. Um, I'm not concerned about any of our uh, general fund accounts at this time, but I am happy to take questions if you have them. Uh, the revolving accounts, there's not a whole lot to update on. We're still monitoring school lunch and early childhood. We did just learn this week that the USDA extended the free meal program through June 30th. So all wow. of our families will be eligible for free breakfast and lunch. Wow. Um, again, we haven't been in the building long enough to have a good head count on who's going to eat when they're here. And hopefully next month I'll have some numbers for you on what we anticipate our government reimbursement revenue to be. Uh, and then the big thing to update on today is the COVID related expenses. So to date, Waitley Elementary has spent around $65,000 on COVID related expenses. We've used various funding sources. We've used some grants. Uh, some of it's come from general funds, some from school choice. And uh, we most recently submitted to the town uh, to request access to the Municipal CARES Act funding. So the town's got separate funding from the schools. However, they can grant money to the schools from their pool of money. So I've been talking with town administrators as to whether or not there are funds available for Waitley Elementary. Um, we're looking for 35,000 in reimbursement plus an additional 25,000 of new items that we would purchase, which is primarily technology related. Um, we're looking to get backup Chromebooks, um, additional laptops for staff who normally, faculty and staff who normally wouldn't have them. IAs, for example, wouldn't have a laptop in a normal year, but now they might need it if either they're working remotely or assisting a teacher with remote work. Um, so that's what we're looking at. You know, we don't know yet if we'll get that all of that part of that or none of that. But I will follow up with Brian next week. I believe their applications were due today. And, you know, obviously he has to balance the needs of town departments, fire police, DPW, you know, whatever else there are for town departments. And then if there is money for schools, um, I know he's willing to at least look at the budget. So that's all I have for today. And I'm happy to take questions if you have them. I have a question. Yep. Um, how how is it on the Chromebooks? Have they have any come into the country for us to purchase yet? I see somebody shaking your head already. So we've ordered a lot of Chromebooks. They just they're on back order. And the last I heard from Scott Paul, 
um, orders were starting to trickle in and I'm not sure what his priority is for getting them out. I know that there's certain grades. Um, I don't know about the elementary level, but middle and high school, every kid has a Chromebook and they need that obviously. Um, and some of them are in really rough shape. So I'm not sure where his priorities land as far as who's getting the orders as they come in. But um, I think he's hoping more are coming in the next month so that we can get them out to students. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We uh, we created an emergency. Uh, um, sorry, guys, I was late. Uh, the commissioner called a meeting yesterday for today, so it was before our appointment here. Um, we we the administrative team met to create an emergency list for those schools who do not have enough, um, Chromebooks for the students they have. We do, Chrissy. How are you here? I, I don't know what the breakdown. We're, is, but... um, we're good. We've been able to provide a Chromebook for every student who whose family indicated that they needed one. Um, so we're in good shape in regard to that, but not having everyone have one is really tricky because they can't do anything on a computer in the school. And not that we want to do a whole lot of stuff on screen when they're in person, but there's nothing they can do. So in terms of like a teacher instructing on um, different remote learning tools that they're going to be using, it's really hard to do that. So we're, we're hoping those are coming in. Yeah, so it's in essence, so we created an emergency list for the entire, I'm calling it the entire district. We have a few schools that need about a dozen in order for students to have computers when they're at home. So we're prioritizing them first with any orders we're getting in and then and then hopefully we'll get the big shipment soon and then everybody will, will be up to speed. Okay. Um, do we have any public comment that came in? I, I didn't receive anything. Nope, Donna checked in with me um, about a half hour ago and she said there was no public comment. And if you haven't gotten any, then there isn't any. Okay. So, unfinished business, the anti racism and equality committee update. So, um, I have uh, Jameson Isler, who is one of our um, uh, co leaders of our um, anti racism equality committee, is going to come on. I told him to come on closer to 4 30. Um, mainly because I, I wasn't sure if the special education thing was going to be part of public comment or his own line. So I messed up on that. So when he does come on, if we could get him to do his report, we'll kind of s squeeze him in, if you wouldn't mind, Maureen, and then get him out. Sure, um, yeah. He jumps on. So, um, yeah, that's where we are there. So he's coming. Okay. How's the school opening going? Or the school ongoing? <laughs> Uh, yep. So this is where it gets a little funny because I really, what I'm going to read now is sort of the principal's report. Um, so it, and Christy, I wrote it that way. It's, it's part of the principal's report, but I think it's it's the best, it's the, it's the good stuff. So put it up front, right? All right. So um, we have, as of October 7th, um, we have 25 students who are um, learning in a full remote program, 80 who are learning in a hybrid program, and that's just between kindergarten and sixth grade. Um, and then we have uh, 13 pre-K students who are coming in for uh, mainly a two-day program. And then, um, let's see. So since the last time we met, and so I was trying to go back to the last report to see, time seems to be this, um, this interesting phenomenon in, in all this is figuring out you know, the, the time element. I feel like the last time we met, it was about four years ago, but it, it wasn't. But since then, um, we have started our in-person days for students who are participating in the hybrid model. And it's really kind of awesome to have kids back in the building. Like this was just the loneliest place. You know, a, a school is supposed to have children in it. Um, and we were really missing that energy and having them back despite the challenges is has been really great. Um, the staff is working really hard to get the help the kids acclimate to sort of our the new way of doing things, the temporary new way of doing things, um, with our goal being to provide all the safeguards possible in a way that doesn't create a stressful or threatening situation or environment, um, which is which is tricky. You know, if, if we approach it the wrong way, um, we could end up frightening children. So um, 
that was one of the things I was kind of keeping an eye on to make sure that we were all on the same page in terms of our approach to helping kids acclimate. Um, but it was really seamless. Kids are much better at all that st all this stuff than than adults are. Um, they don't. I, I thought we'd have. I'd be getting calls all day saying, you know, so and so needs an extra mask break. Can you come down and take him for a walk or something? But you know, the, they're spending a lot of time outside, which which helps to begin with. But um, the kids are just handling it like like champs. It's pretty amazing. It's you know, before we did this, I, I couldn't fully imagine how it was all going to go, and I and I thought, you know, it's gonna it's gonna feel miserable to the kids. It's not gonna they're gonna be back in the building, but I'm not sure if they're gonna get that joy of learning. And they haven't missed a beat. And they seem really, really happy to be here. And I, I think it's because they had a lot of quality time at home with, with families and they were really missing their friends. So it's really good to, to see that. Um, you know, one of our challenges certainly is making sure that we're including the full remote kids in the programs that the in-person kids are getting. Um, and that's sort of going to be a, a buildup where it's a, it's a learning curve, first of all. Um, and also it's difficult to establish a schedule um, that can sync with the students who are at home while we're just figuring out, like, how long does it take to do everything? Everything takes longer because you have to wash hands in between everything that we do. Um, we have to be able to say we're abandoning the plan that we have right now because the kids need a mask break. So we're going outside to do that. So um, that's a work in progress. And I know, you know, it's challenging for the, the folks who are full remote, but we are working on it. Teachers are getting really creative about how to make sure that every kid is being attended to and, and receiving the instruction and attention that they need and deserve. Um, our tents arrived the week of September 28th and were installed on October 2nd. So um, I don't know how it happened. It was pretty, pretty quick. They came from Iowa and they arrived um, prior to the first full day. So it was really great to have that set up. Um, and it makes a nice outdoor learning space. Um, we've used it for the rain and it's, it's moder moderately helpful in the rain because they have no sides. Um, and the reason they have no sides is because they, you know, we need the airflow so that if kids are out there with their masks off, we've got the airflow, but, um, it has been challenging. And unfortunately, <laughs> Cohort A has won the weather lottery. They've gotten the best days. You know, we haven't had any rain on cohort A days, and it just seems to be that on cohort B days, it, it's always it's always raining. And you know, Beth sees me out there with an umbrella, like like every day. I had to walk around in my slippers the other day because I got soaked at the at arrival time. So I feel badly for cohort B, but you know they're they're handling it. It they just they just do. Um, and I'm hoping that that will turn around for us pretty quickly. Um, today was unbelievably beautiful. Like if we could have every day like that, we could be okay learning outside for the entire year, but we know that that is, um, not going to be our reality. So we are always going to be spending as much time outside as possible, but we know that the reality is once cold weather comes, we're going to be spending more time inside. Um, and my hope is that by having this time period when, when we're spending a lot of time outside, it's helping kids just get used to being back around human beings and being back and practicing all those, uh, you know, social distancing and keeping the mask on so that it'll be a little bit easier. They've built up the stamina before we have to spend long periods of time in the building. Um, and even when we do spend, we're in the building more, mask breaks are going to be key. Those are not ever going to go away. And mask breaks are not denied to any child. We know that you know, you could have just had a mask break and 10 minutes later, a child is struggling and, and we have made provisions to make sure that every kid can have a mask break when they need it. Um, so I wanted to thank the town of Waitley for helping with the purchase of those tents. They used um, some of their municipal COVID money to help us purchase those. Um, and they're going to serve a dual purpose because when all of this is over, um, they will be part of the 250th celebration for the for the town so and i'll be happy to see the tents are lovely but i'll be happy to get to a time when we do not need tents um so the, the students seem to be enjoying the time outside and the teachers and instructional assistants have put a lot of work into creating those learning environments outside um both inside and outside and i know if you haven't been here um we have all kinds of little spots around campus um we've got tree stumps in big circles where um, kindergarten meets. We have, um, 
know, people have brought all their materials out that are under the tent. We've got easels and bookcases and um, they, they've really done some extraordinary things with the spaces that we have. Um, and we are working through the many challenges of creating a new model of education. And I know it's so frustrating for everyone. We have technical difficulties from time to time. Um, and, you know, figuring out the whole, bringing the full remote kids into the, into the classroom is, is tricky, but we're working through it. And I'm really grateful to be in a place where people are taking initiative to figure things out. Um, you know, we've got lots of good solutions to, to problems. One of the things that um, we're working towards is having more time for teachers to share information with one another because I'm noticing that something that someone's struggling with in one class, another teacher has figured out. So trying to get that information shared um, is the key. And lastly, I'd like to thank the students, staff, families, and town for pulling together to support our mission of providing the very best educational experience despite the current health crisis. It's, it's really been... It's, it's been amazing to see how people have just jumped right in. So thank you to everyone. Can I have a question? Did, did you guys lose power at the school last week? Nope. And even if we did, we wouldn't because we've got the generator. I'm just trying to see how, how that, if you did lose it, how was it and stuff, so. We're prepared for everything here. Well, I know we are. Thank <laughs> God we are. We don't have to go to another town. We get to stay in our little town. And, you know, that's that was yeah, the I was in the building when the storm came through. And then when I drove home from work a little while later, it, it dawned on me how bad the storm was. Oh. It, you know, it, it hit here and some things are blown around. And um, we lost a temporary canopy. Um, but on my way home, you know, down at the end of uh, Long Plain when it meets Depot, trees were down everywhere. And I thought, I guess it was a little more than I expected. So we really held up well. The tents held up. All our, you know, the, the building is is fine. And um, we managed to hang on to our electricity. So good. Good to hear. Thank you for that, Christy. Um, so new business, we have the MASC, MASS joint conference, which I think is going to be virtual or they're going to have some virtual um, seminars and talks. But we need to nominate an, a delegate for that for our district. I think it's five. So. Yeah, um, so basically it's, it's just for there's a there's a joint, there's a session where there may be a vote. Um, and that's on November 7th at 1 p.m. So in the middle of a Saturday, I don't know what they were thinking. Um, I will say that, you know, I don't know if someone wants to jump all over that um, in a Saturday afternoon, but some of the other committees are going to look and see what the agenda is to see if it's uh, a necessary vote. That agenda is supposed to come out, I think, next week or at the end of this week. Um, to kind of what's, you know, they have different, they're different workshops and stuff, which is good to go and kind of check in, just look it over and see if there's anything that interests you. That's the nice part. We don't have to commit to a weekend, but... You can see what's being voted on. I've been, I've looked at years past, there's, Bob, you can even remember that sometimes there's just not stuff that's relevant to our school system um, that the, the associations um, is voting on. So, but you still, we should submit our delegate just to show that we're participating. Okay. So I, can, I, I, you know. I don't mind doing that. I, I nominate Maureen. <laughs> I, was, I was hoping you were gonna say that. <laughs> It's not how I'd like to spend my Saturday, but no. I, I've done it once before. Isn't this um, the kind of stuff you're supposed to give to the, the newest member of the team? <laughs> <laughs> I was staying quiet. Maybe next year. I don't want to scare her. Yeah, we gotta break we gotta break her and not scare her away. Um, is there a second? I second. Okay. All in favor, Bob? Yes. Or roll call Bob. Beth? Yes. yes. Okay, Maureen, yes. So now we're on to snow days. Maureen, can, can we um, go oh, back? I on see. The yes. thing? I love yep, to introduce I see. Jameson Isler, who is a yes. co chair of our anti racism and equality committee. He's also a teacher in a neighboring district and a parent at Frontier, and he left. <laughs> um, so when he comes back on, we can, you know, I can start the next thing. 
Well, you know, studies is kind of whatever. Um, <laughs> maybe you'll, you'll come back. All right. Um, yep, here he is. Yeah. So, so James, I gave you just a really long introduction as if you were going to give a long speech. <laughs> you ready for us there? Un unmute yourself. Control D. Control D. I think he might be having other technical difficulties. No. Nope. We can't hear you, Jameson. Control D or unmute. Looks like his screen is locked up yeah. now. Can you unmute him, Darius, or no? No, he's he's got audio issues, apparently. So we can mute people. We just can't unmute them because that wouldn't. Can't be unmute. Them. It's a good thing for you all to know. If you can mute yourself, go off, do something. Can't unmute you and go into your living room. <laughs> it's a very important feature. I could kick you out now too. Um, all right, so I don't know what you want to do, Maureen, but I guess we can, you know, we can, to, we can talk about the snow days and sure. then we can get back on. So basically the snow days agenda item is, um, I just got, the commissioner just talked about it a minute ago when I was on the phone with him, um, that they're going to come out with guidance, but basically the guidance is saying that they're going to allow, um, schools to decide if they are having a snow day as a remote day for this year only. Um, and so I was just getting feedback from all the school committees as we go through this. Um, you know, I, I think one of the things, you know, as I've been telling other school committees that one of the things we only had like two snow days, I think last year before we had a shutdown. And um, I know that because the senior class was really mad at me, um, but we did have a lot of two hour delays. And so um, our system really isn't set up. Here he is, I think. Yes, no. Unmute yourself, Jameson. There we are. Can you hear me? We can hear you. And I give you a nice introduction that you, you missed the end part, but you, you're high on this pedestal right now. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I did introduce you as the co-chair and that you're going to give us an, an update on how things are going. All right. Awesome. Uh, let me find my file that I was just looking at. Okay, here we go. So how are things going? Um, well, it's been a crazy time in my life outside the uh, committee because I'm back to teaching. So uh, I had to check in with Kelsey real quick and really get to skinny. But um, Information from the elementary schools, uh, teacher and staff, teachers and staff in the district have been sorted into small groups of approximately 10 people per group around the following topics, uh, the history of racism in America and white privilege and identity. Uh, the history of racism in America group is about to, is about expanding American history to include marginalized and, oppre and oppressed perspectives. Some of the topics they're discussing are um, the genocide of indigenous peoples, how the, how the South was able to rewrite uh, slavery and Civil War history and misconceptions of the civil rights movement. The white privilege and identity group is, is a little self-explanatory. Uh, that group is studying topics including uh, race as a social construct, uh, white affirmative action, and color blindness. Uh, in their small groups, teachers and staff are moving through a curriculum that was developed by the Professional Development Committee and Amanda Mosea, one of our graduates. And, uh, and uh, she's like, uh, she's not a co-chair, but she's a part of, of that, of our brain trust, I guess I would say. Um, there are eight sessions, and each session is approximately an hour in length so that they can really break down the topics. And they're in the third week of small group work and the feedback has been, she says, overwhelmingly positive. That's a quote from her. Uh, at the high school, 
the peer leadership group is back up. Their first meeting is next Wednesday. Uh, there was a school-wide viewing of the documentary, I'm Not Racist, Am I? And follow-up discussions in classes. And uh, the logo redesign is underway. And we hope to have three student drawn options to vote on by the end of November. So that is our update. Okay, thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Jameson? Nope, I'm good. Thank you, Jamie. Yeah. Thank you very Appreciate much. It. That was great. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. So the committee is going to continue to give us, I met with Kelsey today briefly, and the committee is going to continue to give us updates on how things are going, and they really wanted to be able to come to our committees and voice that. So um, you voice what's going on, and it also keeps accountability going, because it's our, kind of our public forum out that we continue moving forward on that. I will also just say on the side, we are also doing the four pillars that we talked about last time. Those, those groups are still meeting as well, the curriculum. Um, the professional development, which he talked about, policy and procedure and school culture, which is kind of tied into some other stuff. So all those kind of things are all moving. Um, I think the one thing that we've had to uh, keep an eye on is not go too quickly because there's so much going on, you know, especially with a lot of things on teachers' plates is trying to balance that up. But it's, in, a, in a nutshell, that's the summary there. Okay. Can I go back to snow days? Yeah. <laughs> so anyways, yeah. I'm just... Yeah, it's 75 degrees today, and we're talking about snow days. You betcha. <laughs> I'll be it's honest. Very yeah. I said it last night. Maybe I shouldn't have said it because I was kind of in the second school committee meeting. I was getting giddy. Um, but, you know, it used to be something I used to stress a lot about because it, it is a major thing where we we altered the lives of about 1,500 fam, you know, 1500 students' families and then another couple hundred teachers about whether or not we have school or work that day. And so it's a big decision. And so, um, you know, I just want to be able to gather people's ideas and the fact that, um, like the state of Rhode Island just said, basically across the board, all school snow days this, from this year will be remote days. No decisions have to be made. So just the fact that it's going to be a remote day. Um, I was saying before, we do have a lot of two-hour delays, and um, two-hour delays doesn't work well with our current setup. With when we're teaching kids remotely and in person, the amount of breaks and stuff we have to do, it really turns into a really, I think, kind of a messy day, let alone the messy day to start off with. Um, so, you know, I'm, I am concerned about, you know, I'm thinking about that possibly not happening, happening. but I was just getting feedback from people about their thoughts on that. I mean, you're the last committee to kind of give me feedback on it. Um, and I've heard full range from don't get away, don't go, don't get rid of all snow days. Those are kind of magical moments in time where we stop and pause with our families when there's a lot of snow outside to we have the ability to move forward through the curriculum. Let's do it. We've set this up. We can make this happen. So I've kind of heard the full gamut, but I just wanted to you know bring to all of you any other thoughts that you may have on that for, and then I can put together, I'll put together something and bring it back in November or send it out prior. <clears throat> so are you thinking that, um, on a, what would have been a snow day will be a fully remote day that's, for that's everyone. Correct. And you'd get a phone call, hopefully the evening before, that says tomorrow students would not be returning in person. They will be a remote learning session. Um, and then just like we do like on a like on a Wednesday where all students are remote, um, that's what would happen. And so um, it's a lot, I guess it's a lot cleaner than the last minutes, you know, kind of thing. Um, there is obviously, uh, you know, the concern about, you know, power outages. Or what if we get really slammed by a nor'easter? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of playing that into there. Maybe there'll be some, um, sorry, um, um, I'm tr playing into, sorry, I got distracted with them. Um, maybe there'll be some exceptions to that rule. If there's massive power outage, we get one of those huge ice storms that kind of cleans us out kind of deal. You know, maybe we have to shut down school and we'll make up those days. But, um, you know, anyway, I'm just getting feedback on that. What are people's thoughts about snow days? and? Um, I thought this was a good forum. It also goes out to the public as well. So yeah, sounds like a good idea to me. And then with power outages, we'll just have to take it on a case by case basis. Yep. Like you did um, last week. Correct. Yeah. All right. Thanks. It was really what it was. Just a quick discussion about it, and you know, some people are passionate about it. And I started off with by saying, like, I don't know whose decision this is because the state's not giving any direction. Is the school committee decide how we're going to do snow days? And then kind of Bob kind of say what Frontier, Frontier is like, Darius, you can do that. We don't want to all vote on how snow days are going to work. So 
I'm taking input and I'll come up with a plan moving forward on that. So it's basically what I heard from, from that committee. <clears throat> All right. Um, harassment policy. Want we keep going, Maureen? Is that yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the harassment policy is in there. It's a big legal document. Um, it was, they changed the law this year, or this summer, and this is the um, policy that's recommended by our legal counsel. Um, and I'll just kind of go over just the highlights of it, but um, let me go through the highlights of it. Um, basically, it narrows the definition of sexual, sexual assault under Title IX. It's limiting the obligation to investigate complaints to only those um, that occurred on campus, uh, occurred in the school's program or activity and not related to off-campus conduct. Um, there's mandatory responses and obligation of schools in providing supported, including providing supportive measures. Um, there's a change in standard for school liability. There are more detailed grievance procedures that will alter the way schools um, process will process and respond to complaints. Um, hearings are optional, but written questions are required for K-12 schools. Um, schools may choose what standard of evidence to use, uh, uh, preponderance evidence or clear and convincing evidence. And schools must offer both parties an appeal um, from a determination regarding responsibility. So it's a heavy legal document. Um, it, you know, these are approved by school committee. This it does affect all everybody that we deal with within our schools, from students, teachers, um, volunteers, coaches, so on and so forth, um, that kind of stuff. And it's one of those things that it's very when you kind of read through it. If you're not a legal person. Um, it's it's kind of heavy. When we have these things, and Karen Ferrandino happens to be sitting there, who's our Title IX coordinator, um, you know, we use legal counsel. We don't have a lot of these. We do get guidance on complicated ones. Um, we'll use guidance when we go through this. Um, but if you do have heavy questions on this, I ask, this is just a reading of it. It means we'll vote it on, that's the way we do this is you read it once and then we vote it on the next meeting. So it gives you time to kind of process. But if you have legal questions regarding it, I ask you send it to me kind of in advance because I'm going to have to go to the attorney to make sure if it's anything that's outside of something very basic, which you probably don't have a question on, it's going to be something heavier. I'm going to use, I'm going to use legal counsel to make sure that's um, understood. Um, the, there is a slight difference between this one and the one that MASC put out. Our attorney did change, um, felt there was room where he could change that the um, accuser does not have to face the accused in a hearing. And so this particular thing points that out where the MASC, MASC one um, did not. And so he, he feels that that's important that you protect victims um, of these kind of things in that, in the process. So um, I think one of the other biggest changes in it, if you're kind of wondering how did it came up the question yesterday, um, how does it affect the uh, overseeing of that? It used to be the coordinator could do the investigation and oversee the investigation. Now somebody else has to do the investigation. I think that's a good, a good practice because one could have a blind spot if they're overseeing an investigation and doing the investigation and it gives kind of uh, more hands on deck and helping on that it's a little more difficult in a small district like ours to find different people to fill those roles but um you know it kind of cleans up that policy so again that's just the first read and if you have questions you can tell me now or i'll send them to me so who who would be the investigator then another staff member or you or um, no, right now it could be a principal. It could be another administrator. Um, you know, we listed off um, right now, um, you know, Sarah Mitchell and Scott Paul, who are not the school principals, um, as the investigators, you know, based on gender, if gender is an issue within the investigation where we want to have a male or female doing the investigation. So, um, you know, it could be appointed and, and selected by, basically it's selected by Karen. <laughs> Kind of like the new job um, um, to do that. So, and I will say the recommendation from a previous committee already was to remove um, from page, uh, was like page three or so, page two or three, um, remove the names from the policy so that we don't have to vote to change the policy every time we change the names. And actually That's just and then put it on the website so people can know who to contact. Karen's name's already on the website as this. Um, but all the, when we get this approved, add the other people to the website as well, so they know who they can contact to if they want to submit a, a complaint. So um, this sounds like they would have to have very specific training to fill these roles. Is that true? Yes, and there is training provided um, by our associations. 
and council. And you said it was for on, like on school, on the campus or on school time? Yeah, so basically it's um, the, the, one of the big changes it has to be a part of the school. If an event happened at someone's house over the weekend, it's not a school function or event. So, you know, if it's under the control of the school, it becomes a school, um, becomes a school issue. So what, what about social media, that, that kind of? If there was some kind of harassment over social media, you know, is that to what the harassment was? Was it done on school computers and devices? And you know, there okay. are other things that we would use to address that, like student to student harassment and that kind of stuff. Um, we would probably, I'd have to ask legal counsel how we would interpret this law to go after that kind of thing. So, good. I had one more question though. Um, under the consequences of violating the policy, um, it talks about disciplinary actions. Would there be counseling? You know, if it if it was a more minor infraction, would there be counseling as an option? Or is that absolutely that, that could be part of that? Um, in, in depending on who you're talking about is the, you know, what's going on with it. And, it. and within this, it does talk about, you know, also providing counseling for the victim as well and being more supportive to victims of um, of harassment and such. So, it, you know, it all depends on what's going on there. Obviously, if we have students and such involved, we're going to be, that's going to be part of our discipline, that's part of our student handbook. Um, and then um, if it's um, a staff member, again, depending on the situation, um, that could be the recommendation of the a coordinator in their determination. Okay. All right, well, thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else have any questions? No. We also have a first reading of the public comment at school committee meetings? So the last meeting I was sent off to kind of try to find more that can be more opportunities for the public to be able to speak at our meetings given our uh, virtual issues. And what I um, came up with, um, I tried, you know, I looked into phone and phone messages and that kind of thing. Doing it five different ways for five different committees, it really was a, to a real, real burden, um, but we, have stolen another idea from another committee locally that does this is they allow written report a written statements and if someone wants to be invited into the community into the into the meeting so it's the same as attending you just kind of let us know in advance that you're coming i can send the, the link out to those people who want to come to our committees to to give a public comment so that really i think opens up that that um open, opens that up a lot i think that what was interesting we didn't talk about i think at our last meeting that at the conway meeting they talked about how this actually opens up more availability for public comment because not everybody can meet all our meetings at whenever the meeting is. No matter when you send our meeting time, I know it's on our agenda for later, but whether it's in the morning, in the evening, you know, people have things that come up and they still may wanna have statements read to the school committee um, to be publicly um, heard. Um, and this kind of gives that avenue as well. So, um, so basically, and then also reducing the 24 hours to the day of, um, as well, that time restriction was given to me by feedback from committee members that that seemed like a bit much. Can't we just do it the day of? And so, you know, we picked three o'clock that day um, because I, the staff member is, is Donna, who picks those up and needs a little bit of time to make sure she gets them and gets them to me in time for meetings. So, so that, again, this is the first reading on this one as well. So you can provide me feedback and thoughts on that. Okay. So um, moving on, we have our update on special ed services. Hi, Karen. Hi. Do you want me to just kind of start with Hank? I saw Holly pop on too. Hi, uh, for those of you who don't know me, hi Beth. Um, I'm Karen Ferrandino. I'm the Director of Special Education. Um, and I'm going to just kind of provide a general overview to kind of help you out with uh, special education, but 
follow up um, with any questions and direct the conversation where you'd like. Uh, as far as Waitley, you have 23 students on IEPs. Okay. Uh, you have about 127 students. So you're about 18% of your population is on IEPs. You have two uh, full-time special education teachers. Uh, that's K through six. You also have a preschool teacher. Preschool is known as with and without special needs. Because the reason you have preschools in, in uh, Massachusetts is to provide inclusive environments to have students with IEPs get their services. Right? We have no universal pre-K. So we develop preschool programs to ensure that our students in preschool so you become eligible, you uh, can become eligible to receiving IEP services at three years old. You know? So some students actually get three years in preschool. Right now you have one student in the preschool uh, that's on an IEP. And like Chrissy said, uh, most of right now, what I call now the time of COVID, uh, the way the preschool in Waitley is working is is really working with families, I believe, Chrissy, right, to kind of come up with an individualized approach to really um, allowing access to um, in designing that programming. So the majority of families attend about two times a week on half days. Uh, so the, out of the 23 students that are currently IEPs, uh, the K through six, uh, they're split between the two liaisons. And when you say liaison, that's the, pre, that's the teacher that provides the special education instruction. But it's also the liaison, so they run the IEP team meetings unless they run out, reach out to an administrator uh, to administer the meetings. And they put together the IEPs, and they're sort of the case manager of working with the families. And with those 20, so an IEP is an individualized education plan. And what was happening is we were building up to reopening. Uh, there was a guidance by um, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education thinking, hey, what's really important this year is partnering with families and getting out a special education learning plan that really communicates to families how these IEPs are going to look a little differently. How are they going to be implemented in, in either a remote or a hybrid or an in-person, which we don't have a full in-person, so remote or a hybrid, what would that look like? And you know, to report back, uh, when that information was coming out, we met with principals and thought, you know what, we're really going to uh, contact all families by September 4th, really get that input from families, reach out to families, and put together this special education learning plan uh, and provide that information of what the IEP services will look like to families. And I'm happy to say in Waitley, um, it's my understanding that every family has been contacted. Um, and every family has received a special education learning plan through that communication. Uh, one of the other things that was really big uh, as we were opening was how we're going to do IEP meetings and evaluations. Uh, and I think one of the biggest concerns actually was the initial eligibility, you know, and really getting the word out to families that we were going to be able to do evaluations. What was it going to look like? Were we going to do remote evaluations? Were we going to do in-person evaluations? And, uh, you know, Waitley's kind of come. They've had a request um, and really looking at how they're going to meet that eligibility requirement. So the idea is if there's a concern, a parent or a teacher can request evaluations. And that's evaluating to determine eligibility for special education. And we're happy to say that that, that system is, is up and running and we're communicating. And uh, the evaluators can be anyone from the special education teacher, the psychologist, the speech language pathologist, the occupational therapist, the physical therapist. So when you're evaluating a student, I don't want you to think of like one person sitting there evaluating a student. So it's a very complex situation in which you're looking at one student and many different evaluators in a short window of time to kind of get that information. So there's a lot of questions about it, but it's really exciting to see it up and running and the evaluation team communicating with families on how that will be done and what that would look like. So all families have been contacted. IEP meetings are up and running. We are doing all IEP meetings remotely, unless there's a family member where that's just not possible. 
you know, and then they would express that it's not possible. And our idea right now, district wide, not just with Waitley, but uh, is we would make arrangements for that family to come in and access it remotely. So we might have different members of the team instead of having a large team all around one conference table, we would make uh, it available for families to come in to access it remotely and for teams to do that. Um, one of the other things that came up was uh, students with significant and complex needs. Uh, the DESI, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, put out a, a, a guidance saying that districts should really prioritize students with high needs to, to have more in person than maybe the model for general education students allows. Um, and in Waitley, with 23 students, we're really, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Chrissy, but I think that the idea that is we really can individualize through communication and conversation with parents, uh, with, with the special education team that you have, a full-time SLP, uh, an occupational therapist, physical therapist, two special education teachers, and a preschool teacher, and uh, the principal who communicates with families as well, that that is done on an individualized approach. Yeah, our, our size kind of lends itself and, and the strength of our team lends itself to really looking at each individual child and, and creating a really unique program for each student. Um, we we'll work hard to try and um, meet all the needs of every student in the building. And all right, I can't say enough about our amazing team. They're really very flexible and patient, willing to, to work through things till we find a solution that works well for families, works well for the student, and works well for what's going on uh, within the school. And the, the, one of the, all the special educating, the team is all in the building. Uh, so the faculty is really able to work directly with the students. That's very exciting. There were so many unknown pieces in the stress. I think with the faculty back and the students back in the building, it's really uh, exciting to know that the, eval the IEP teams are meeting and up and running. Uh, the evaluations are being done and just some of the questions as far as how would we do related services. If you could imagine you have a speech language pathologist who might be servicing any student from pre-K through sixth and having to pull them out of the classroom. So there was a lot of questions with that and with the help of Meg Birch um, and just a lot of communication between the faculty and the administrative team, really listening to people, uh, really having to use professional judgment and really looking at the students needs to determine which students on particular days would really be prioritized for in person and which students would maybe be accessed remotely and watching people communicate that and really uh, putting it all together to make it happen has been really it's been really exciting and I see the enthusiasm and the commitment and I I know our psychologists are eager to be back evaluating uh, and for the most part right now, they're thinking that evaluations will happen in person, but we know that, excuse me, outside in person, uh, but we know that can't go on for an extended period of time. So preparing with plexiglass barriers uh, and really thinking about how we use materials um, and how we share those with kids and what we need to do to kind of um, keep, keep them safe and healthy. Uh, is all up and running, so it feels confident. But I and I also know that you know, and I see Holly in Asia here, uh, and as far as the CPAC, and would like to hear from them too, uh, some of their thoughts. Okay. Or if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I know there's a lot. Hi. Um, Hi, Holly. I wanna thank you guys for putting the special education on your agenda and inviting us here tonight. We really appreciate that. Um, as a Wes parent, um, I have seen the hard work that is going into the school this year. I stop by the school sometimes and I'm surprised how um, happy the students really seem to be. I know I shouldn't say I'm surprised, but with the masks and the little ones and, and it seems everyone is following the rules and they're in their lines. And I saw an outdoor gym class and all the tents and it really seems to be working really great at Waitley. And um, I know that all the special ed teachers, liaisons and everything are working really hard to provide services for our children. And it's really clear to me that they are doing their best with the resources that they have to um, 
to provide everything they can for our students. Um, I can say that from personal experience, the individual needs of students is really important. At Waitley, they work very hard to um, really work to the individual. I think our small size is such a positive through all of this. Um, and everybody knows everybody and it's it's really it's really great. Um, we did have a lot of concerns at the beginning of the year. And I think as far as Waitley is concerned, it seems to me that for the most part, services and learning plans have have been out. I'm sure there's a few that haven't um, because you know it's difficult. And um, you know, we do get concerns and questions from lots of parents and um, we always encourage parents to reach out to their SPED liaisons and to Chrissy um, right away, right away. As soon as they they have um, any issues, you know, reach out um, with communication. It's um, so important. And at the beginning of the year, we had many of the principals at our CPAC meetings. Um, we had Kim McCarthy and Scott Paul doing um, a presentation on Google Enterprise and how to work that uh, specifically for SPED students. Um, I do feel that uh, communication can still be an issue, not specific to West, but on a district-wide level. We had a CPAC meeting earlier this week that uh, Karen attended, and we discussed as a group how to better reach all families in the district, including those who don't have special education plans, because I, I meet a lot of parents that don't have special ed plans yet, but they have concerns about evaluations or their, you know, how their children are progressing. Um, so I think it's important to reach all families. And um, that's a big part of what we do as a CPAC is educating families about the special education process. So we, we spoke along with Karen, we are gonna work on the possibility of getting a CPAC page on the district website and emails out to all families to help them connect with the CPAC. Um, well, I, there are so many good stories and glowing stories about what happens and, and how the teachers we have, and um, it's really wonderful. I do say that we come to these meetings because we do get you know concerns from parents um, for over the years about you know communication over the special ed plans and you know things not going the way they should or not being followed and parents not knowing everything that's going on with their student. And I would say that this breeds mistrust. And once a parent loses a little bit of that trust, it's very difficult to get it back, um, to send your child and not fully trust in where they're going. It's difficult. And um, I think the it's, just so important for parents to be truly included from the very beginning, for districts to be open and honest about everything that's happening right up front, because if parents find out after the fact, um, they feel left out and they have trouble trusting. And that has happened, you know, to other parents, uh, many parents that we've, you know, that reach out to us. Um, but you know, you hear, I know when CPAC shows up, it's like, here's a list of negative things that are going wrong. Because we do get a lot of that. And, and it's important to us to represent all parents and to keep keep on all the things. There's even a few handful of parents that are feeling this way is too many. Um, but as, I do want to end on a positive note. I CPAC is working really hard to reach all families and to help educate them and help them um, really team with the school because when it's a true team amazing things happen for our students when the parents and everyone really can come together and um come up with a plan um and i want to thank chrissy and all the sped teachers that are helping me personally and all the parents um beth uh thank you for stepping up and joining the school committee it's nice to see you here um thank you for having us tonight Okay, thank Holly, you. Holly, I just want to say thank you for that piece about when someone comes to you that your first piece of advice is, you know, reach out and communicate with us here at school because, you know, sometimes people don't want to go that route right away. And 
they go and they talk to someone, but if you don't talk to the people who can do something about the, the thing that you're concerned about, it, it creates a, a little situation. So I really appreciate that when people come to you, that that's your, your advice among other things that you work with them on, but I appreciate that. Well, I find that you welcome it when I come. Well, all the SPED teachers I work with too, they, they welcome the input and we work through things and I encourage all parents to do that. Thank you very much. I, I do agree that communication is very important and um, let's keep that going, keep the two-way communication. And um, I think that's a great idea to have a page for CPAC on the district webpage as a resource. Thank you. Thank you for your update. Anyone else have any questions or comments? I'll just use this opportunity, Holly, to let you know that uh, we have communicated about that today through emails, and I'll, I'll, I'll be in touch with some ideas. Um, and I thank you for the focus on that um, early outreach and have some ideas about that as far as parents and that communication um, early on um, and the, the stress and uh, meeting and partnering early on to relieve stress and opening that communication. It's good ideas. Thank you. And I, I didn't realize um, until recently that 504s were not under special ed, that they were part of, well, that they're overseen by the principal, the building principal, right? Um, yeah, just a quick, I'm sorry, Warren. I, the way my computer is, I have a little line, so I can't see when you're talking. There you go, I see your whole, all of Sorry. Now. Yeah, so I, I talked over you. but. Um, just a quick blurb, since this is public, um, about that. I think it's, it's, it's helpful to know. Um, when we request evaluations to determine uh, eligibility, um, then you're requesting evaluations to determine eligibility for special education, OK? Uh, you know, you can work with your school and say, you know what, I just think, believe my child just needs accommodations. I don't think they have. Um, are in need of specialized instruction. And that's the difference. So when we evaluate to determine eligibility for special education, your child may be found ineligible for special education. And I'm just going to tell you why, if you don't mind, for one second, because I think it's good for the public and everybody to know. When you evaluate, the very first thing you determine is, is there an educational disability? The second thing you determine is, is the child making effective progress? The third thing is, is it that disability that's affecting that progress? The fourth and very last thing for special yeah. education is, if all the other answers are yes, is do you need specialized instruction to make that progress? And if so, you're eligible for an IEP. If no, the team may want to continue that discussion and say, you know what, you don't need specialized instruction, but you sure as heck, they might not say it that way, but you sure, you sure may need um, accommodations. And that's the big difference. There are two different laws. One is the Americans with Disability Act, and one is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. One is special education and one is a 504. But it, 504 is just accommodations. It's not specialized instruction. So if your child, if you feel, really needs specialized instruction and not just accommodations, you're requesting evaluations for special education. And in that process, they may be found ineligible, but the team doesn't stop there. They then think, what accommodations? So they kind of overlap in that determination process a lot. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm kind of looking, yeah. So that's how it's separate. And it really falls, 504s fall under general ed because there's specifically accommodations in the general ed classroom. There's no specialized instruction. It's accommodations in the general ed environment. I hope that made sense to everybody. But and I'll uh, also add that you to, you don't need to go through the evaluation process in order to qualify for a 504 plan for accommodations. Um, most often, it it comes to me not through full evaluation, but you know through um, feedback from teachers and you know parents who are having concerns, and we're able to put some things in place for students, um, and and really putting it on paper. I, I like to think that when we're here at Waitley Elementary School, um, we give 
kids whatever accommodation is needed in the moment. You know, every child has different moments of needing different supports. Um, but having it written down um, really, really covers us in terms of um, your child then can have accommodations for MCAS testing or whatever standardized testing might come up. Um, if you went to another school district, you'd have that 504 that has all those accommodations written down. So we, we, we do the accommodations in the 504 plan plus, you know, we want to make sure that we're always meeting kids' needs. Um, but it's a much easier process than the IEP process. And it's also um, something that, that seems to change more often than you would change an IEP. You know, we'll put some accommodations in place and then check back in. And if they're not really working, then we can adjust and change the 504 um, quite, quite easily. So that's a little, little bit of the difference. I'd just like to say that the CPAC helps people with 504s and um, IEPs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So if there's no more questions, we'll move on or comments. We'll move on to the school committee meeting schedule. We had had meetings. We had been having them on Tuesday mornings at 815 in the morning but we had a request to make them later in the day so that um, people, other people could attend meetings. And I know that um, you can, if you have a comment, you could submit it in public. I mean, you could submit it in advance, but um, I, I, I think it's probably a good idea to make it later in the day, especially during this, this uh, time with COVID and so many things changing and up in the air. Uh, does anyone else have any comments about that? I know Darius, you. I, I like the morning meetings too, but I, I, I personally feel we have to accommodate the public. I do miss muffins and coffee with all of you. <laughs> I do too. We'll get back to that one of these days. Um, my personal comment is that and Maureen's right about our our situation right now with COVID and stuff. But before this, all these years that I've been on the school committee, that a no one showed up to our meetings. Um, you know, I, I mean, but Maureen's right. Maybe maybe somebody wants to join in our meeting that wants to say something. But there again, with public comment the way it is now. I'm not sure if it's going to make any difference whether we have it at 8.15 in the morning or 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock in, in, in the afternoon. Um, I know we did it originally to try to cut down on someone's meeting nights. And, you know, it's it does help him. He's got a family too. But, I mean, if we get a bunch of people that say 8.15 is not good, that we got to have them later, then, you know, that's something to look at. But if we're not getting – I know one is too many, I guess. But there again, for all these years, no one ever came to our meetings. No one. Except for maybe Mr. Antea would come to one of our meetings. <laughs> you want him to come more often? Well, he is retired, you know. <laughs> That's true. Um, I I also agree with Maureen. Um, I feel like in these times, especially if someone is coming to the committee saying, you know, I would like you to make them more available, um, we should do that at this point. And then, you know, if these people are not showing up, if there is not public comment, then, you know, at that point, maybe we come back together and say, hey, no one is coming to these. We have no public comment over a certain course of, you know, so many months. And then we go back to eight o'clock or 8.15. Yeah, I mean, for a few years before I was on school committee, I think I was one of the only ones that would attend um, from the public. And it was, I didn't have any comments. I just wanted to attend. But um, we have had, since COVID, a lot more members of the public attending and interested and interested in school committee too. So I, th I think it's a good idea. 
at yeah, this time. I think a lot of the interest obviously was over the summer when everyone was sort of holding our breath, waiting to find out what was school going to look like. I mean, there were record yeah. numbers of people attending school committee meetings. It's pretty, pretty impressive. Um, and it is my hope. I don't want people to lose interest, <clears throat> but I, I'd like to think that if people don't show up, it's because things are going things are going okay. How can, how can we tell, how can we tell if, if somebody's watching, watching the you know, we can't tell who's watching and, you know, because of the no way we have, you know, being invited, unless you invite in like Holly or, or, you know, we invited Holly in and stuff. So it's like, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to know. You know, so you can't see when when they're live streaming. You can't see. Okay. You can see the recorded ones on YouTube. But you can't see who's watching the live stream. You can't see who's watching the live stream. But when it gets the YouTube ones, you can see how many times it's been clicked on. And you know, five of those are Donna trying to make sure the notes are correct. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I actually text her. I says. Uh, who's doing the minutes tonight? And I and I, she says, I think Maureen's doing the minutes tonight. I says, okay. <laughs> I'll have to watch the recording a few times myself <laughs> to. So Pardon. what do you? So what do you guys think we should do then? I mean, it's if we don't know who who's watching. I mean, do we change what what's been working for the eight fifteen? I mean, what do you think, Darius? I mean, if you want to make an evening meeting, make an evening meeting. So it just it's, it gets a lot tighter um, uh, this time of year. It's a lot tighter. Um, it's not as easy this time of year. Once it gets budget season, and you know, right now my schedule is not as booked every single night. When the budget season comes, and I have to go before select boards and finance committees, and then we have to have emergency secondary meetings and that kind of stuff. It gets you know that's you know that's when I you know the, the pinch was even more on me. But um, you know, let's go ahead and and, and pick an evening. Um, let me quickly present. Um, uh, I have one more question. Can we, can we, can we send out a something to all the parents through emails or paper route and ask them what they prefer? I mean, if that's what we're looking for, as parents to join in, you know, to watch a meeting after we, you know, after we have the meeting. I mean, maybe that's. Maybe that's what we should find out before we make any drastic changes. Well, I, I had a request from teachers, and they they're on in their contracted hours during the eight fifteen time, so they can attend, and they they wanted to be able to attend. Okay, that's reason enough. Yeah. All right. Right now, you're currently on your next one is November tenth at eight fifteen, so. I guess you, you probably want to pick something that's consistent. Um, right now, the, you know, let me try to pre let me present my screen. I can show you the, um, <clears throat> for those of you. Uh, Does four o'clock on Tuesdays work for you, Darius? So right now, this is the, the schedule that we have out. Obviously, we did saying we already blew up October. Instead of doing a joint meeting, we decided to have individual meetings with every single school. And that was actually my decision where, you know, because um, it just, it was so much going on coming out of, out of September. So we didn't do the joint meeting, but um, if you look at November here in December, um, we were having on the 8th. So obviously you're gonna have to pick a different day if you're gonna do the evening. Like I, there's no way I can do, you know, four, five, six, seven, you know, are already difficult to five hours in a row of the other nights of school committee. Does it have to be a Tuesday? No. So you can pick any day. Basically, you can pick any day of the week you want to work off of. But I would try to keep it like, is it the week of, is it the second week or the third week? And then just kind of we can run off of like that, that Wednesday. Whoops. Is Deerfield at 530, Darius, on those Tuesdays? Is that what I'm reading? Yes. Filled at yeah. five. So everything's actually five. Those all have to be changed because we ran out of time the first time we did it. And the virtual meetings take a little bit longer, believe it or not. Um, so 
I'm moving all the five, all the five thirties are actually fives now. So they're fives and sevens. Okay. Can, can we do, can we do like, if you're talking teachers like three thirty or can we can try to try to help Darius on not, not another night being out? You also, I mean, it's got to run off, you know, it has to run. You guys have to be able to make it. It's your meeting. So, um, I mean, the reason we picked morning is because at the time, three people who were on the committee could do mornings. Um, so, I mean, if you want to do, um, let's go ahead to, well, right away. If you can't do the second week of November. If you can do a Wednesday or a Thursday, you can do a Thursday, I guess. You can do the 12th. So you can do, you can do Thursdays at four if you want, or five. On the first week, first or second week. I mean, second or third week, rather. Beth, do you have any bad days or bad afternoons where you can't? Um, no, as long as, you know, they're set in advance, I should be able to make any afternoon time. All right. Darius, you know, just you know, to try to keep it in line, can we do, if you have a five o'clock one, we're still doing virtual. How about, can we do three 30 and the teachers can, teachers can chime in after the kids leave in their classrooms or what do you think? I, I can't pull that off. That'd be, that'd be like six and a half hours of straight meetings for me. Okay. Repeating the same thing over well, and over could, again. Three <laughs> 30 on a Thursday though, instead. Doesn't look right. like a lot on Thursdays. Right. I mean, you could do three 30 on a Thursday. Yeah, I'm good with Thursdays. Yeah. All right. Is 3.30 a good time? That's fine with me. Yep. Um, Is that going to be okay for the teachers, Maureen? Yeah. I I don't know. Uh, I think w they work till, what, 3.15 officially? Mm -hmm. So they would have to watch the meeting from the school if they're in the building or from home, I guess, if it's... I don't know if they're all in who's in school, even on the remote days. So I I think that should be fine. Mm. But uh, Holly. Hi, nothing to do with your schedule, but the live stream doesn't seem to be working for this meeting. FGAT's live streaming um, a sport right now and on YouTube and just for their future. Um, and also you can see who's watching. If you look right now, it'll tell you like 11 people or um, are watching currently. But I was just for the future when people want to tune in, I couldn't get in live stream. Okay. Sorry Thank to you. interrupt. Hmm. I'm retired. You guys pick the time and date. I'll be there. All right. Well, why don't we say 3.30 for the next meeting? And uh, if there's any issues, we'll just have to talk about it again. Yeah. And we get some feedback from people who who watch the live feed and, and say, hey, you know, I wish it was a little later or whatever. And then we can make an, another adjustment for the following month, you know, on in an hour. You know, we'll try to keep it on that second Thursday or whatever to try to keep it, you know, keep schedules going. Yeah, I mean, I think we're going to have to try to we have to hammer it in because what's going to happen is my nights will start to get loaded. And all of a sudden, if you want to move it, you're not going to be able to move it. So, you know, once we get to budget season, it, it gets crazy because we have subcommittee meetings. We have, um, I have to go to, uh, you know, town meetings, not town meetings, but we go to town meetings too, but you know, the, uh, finance meetings and that kind of stuff. And then we have another, we have additional meetings on top of that. So I just kind of want to, we should, we should settle on like, you know, if three thirty is too early, do four o'clock on Thursdays, moving forward on the second week, Let's book it and then adjust it from there if we have to. Because I mean, you're always going to add meetings. You always can add meetings or you can always cancel meetings too. Um, but um, it's just so that we can have it something stable in the calendar. So we can do next month that way, but we really just need to kind of hammer it out just because our calendars get full. So in your yeah, story, I would, so I would say four o'clock on Thursdays, if that's agreeable to everyone, considering that was okay with whoever Maureen talked to for tonight's meeting. Yeah, and that gives teachers a chance to get home if they would prefer to watch it from home. Yeah. And maybe if there were any other members of the public that were getting home later. So 
yeah, let's say four o'clock. Sounds good. So next month, it's November 12th, Thursday at 4 p.m. Okay. So next on the agenda is executive session. Do we need to go into executive session, Darius? We do. Um, and I would, you know, ask if we could just quickly do the reports so that if anybody is oh, watching, they don't have to sit around and wait for the, the ending of the show, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then because you're going to go to executive session, you have to come back to vote the MOA if you choose to vote the MOA. Um, and that's kind of, I guess you would say it's boring television. And so if people have to wait for it, sure. they'll be bored. Um, and really the reports is the only one left, I think, is mine because Chrissy did hers. I think, right, Chris? And the collaborative. And the collaborative, yep. Yeah, and there's isn't much. To Chair, if you want to give a report, Maureen. Um, I do not have a report as the chair. I'm not sure what that would be anyway, but um, <laughs> so we did have a, we, we did have a collaborative meeting at the end of September and um, you know, they were electing officers and appointing other positions and talking about their new strategic plan. But I don't know if I said in any of the meetings, Bill Deal, who is the executive director, he's retiring at the end of this year. I think we might have talked about that. So they talked about the transition plan. His deputy director, Karen Reuter, Reuter she's going to take on the responsibilities as the interim executive director until um, the new one is appointed. And they changed the timeline of that and they have a whole committee, a couple of different committees involved in the um, planning of hiring the new executive director. But they were hoping to have them hired for July 1st next year. That is in tune with the typical hiring period um, for that type of position. So let me see, I don't, I, th I think that was it for uh, the big news. So, Darius, how about your report? I, I sent you all my report. Um, I believe yeah, I think it was yesterday that I sent it. Um, I, I'll just quickly go through the highlights of it. The you know our school improvement plans. You know, based on the, the chaotic start of the school year, I'm asking that we present those in December. Um, I think the highlights of those plans are going to be probably continuing the work we're already doing. Um, but um, it's normally something that would be coming out this month. And it's just, as you know, we're, we've been overwhelmed with other stuff. Um, I did hire uh, Meg Burst full time as our nurse leader. You know, she was funded off a grant for a part time nurse leader last year um, due to the, the needs that I have to have uh, oversight of uh, managing the COVID needs of our of our district um it become it's become a kind of a full-time position that kind of is a full-time position um right now we're, we're hoping to increase the grant spending on salaries but if we can't do that if it's not allowed to us by the state um, we're gonna have to pull some of that from the budget and shelly's aware of that and we'll have to figure out um what the weightless share will be of that um so it's kind of an executive decision there um i am meeting with the town administrators i met with them last week to discuss um basically, you know, school finances, the COVID funding, and then preparing for next year, as we know that next year 22 is going to be a, um, a more difficult financial year. Um, also, the cherry sheets came out from, um, for the, not the cherry sheets, the governor's revised budget came out yesterday. For those of you who haven't seen it, there's not a whole lot of changes from the July budget, but um, it's going to, you know, he's, he's hoping to maintain basically through this year, but we'll see what happens. Um, Shelly kind of was going through it today, but um, it's kind of still kind of early. And that's this year's budget just to get in people's minds. Usually we're talking about next year's budget. So we haven't even got this year's budget that we're operating in. So, you know, they're still trying to work that out. So, um, you know, it does that budget he's proposing does carry schools. It doesn't look like it's going to be that harmful. Right, Shelly? It doesn't look like it's going to hurt us if his budget was to go through for schools. But then again, we work with the town. And so if the town gets crushed it's going to affect the school. So, you know, we're going to have to wait to see, you know, what happens from the state on that. But um, I did get on, I was on the phone with the commission earlier today and, you know, they are saying next year it looks bad. So I don't want to just talk doom and gloom. We're just going to be prepared for a, um, 
uh, an active budget season um, as well. Um, I do biweekly meetings with the locals boards of health and quite frankly, recently been on the phone with them um, several days a week, um, just to regarding different cases and concerns um, about cases in our communities, not just Sunderland, but our own, um, all our communities. So um, just, you know, just FYI that I'm, I'm doing that. I am also doing my new superintendent induction program, even though it's year three and maybe one of the veteran superintendents in, in Franklin County. Um, and we're focusing on um, looking at anti-racism and equity and also surviving COVID um, in reopening of schools and, and, and that kind of stuff. Um, we will still go through the capital project request. You know, I do know it's going to be a tough year in town, so I, I'm going to be going forward knowing that they may not be accepted. But we're going to see what the needs of the schools are, make a list, and make and keep that keep that process going. Um, just as you're talking with constituents of the town or town leadership about, you know, maybe saying like, "Don't be asking for capital requests." It's going to be a tough year financially. Well, we're still going to have our requests, and we'll just have a realistic expectation of whether or not the town's going to have the funds for those requests. So we'll be putting those together. Um, hopefully for the next next meeting, if not December. Um, yeah, that's kind of the highlights of it. And I just want to thank all the um, people who've been donating different things to the school um, and and so forth um, in our community and their time, time, money, and things have been very helpful as we adjusted to the COVID world of education. So that's my report in a nutshell. So I've never done, um, that's it for the um, the regular meeting. We're gonna be going into executive session. For those of you that don't wanna, or that are not gonna be going into executive session, we can you, say Karen. goodbye. Thank you, Chrissy. Thanks, thank you for coming, everyone. Um, it was public. So just, to clarify, just to clarify, am I excused for the, the duration or yeah, do I need got, to- Go home and just, do whatever principals do when they go home. Work more. They work more. Have a good night. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Bye. Good night. Uh, Maureen, Sorry. so basically I have two on there, two executive sessions listed. One of them is about um, uh, I left on there for because we're constantly talking about collective bargaining. Um, I don't yeah. really have an update there. So really, you don't even need to talk about the, the first MGL 30A, Section 21. I'll keep going to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for contract negotiation with non-union personnel, Gripco transportation. So, so the first one. Yep, so um, how do I do this? You just need to do a roll call vote to go into executive session. Okay. And do I have to read that, what you just read? Nope, I just read it for okay. you in the okay, record. Okay, so um, Bob. Yes. Beth. Yes. Maureen, yes. So you're going to leave, make sure you completely exit this session because you don't want that in the background because they'd be able to be able to hear and be recorded in executive session. Therefore, whatever, not having, and then we'll be coming back into this session to vote the MOA if you chose to do so. Okay. okay. See you all. Madam uh, Chair, I make so, a motion to, oops. Go ahead. I make a motion uh, to accept the MOA for Waitley School District and Gripco Transportation. I will second that. Okay, roll call, Bob? Yes. Beth? Yes. Maureen, yes. So that's all set. And um, nothing I'll else? I'll make a motion to adjourn. I will second that. Bob? Yes. Beth? Yes. Maureen, yes. Okay, thank you, everyone. See you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.